Barry, I've been fascinated by cosmology my whole life. Uh, the scientific training I, I did, I uh, did a doctorate in neuroscience, thinking maybe if I understand the brain, I can mm -hmm. understand cosmology better, but I'm not sure that was very successful. Um, and I also love philosophy of philosophy of mind, philosophy of religion, philosophy of science. Um, I was really intrigued when I saw you were involved with maybe even creating the, the concept of a subfield philosophy of cosmology. Uh, tell me what that would be, what it would include, how you'd organize it. Well, I wouldn't take credit for creating <laughs> a subfield. Plato and Aristotle <laughs> and the whole tradition in philosophy have been interested in issues in philosophy of cosmology from Leibniz and so on. But cosmology itself developed enormously from 1915 or so on with the advent of Einstein's theory of general relativity and all of the incredible observational results that cosmologists have obtained in from 19 well, from Hubble onward now into this um, uh, research that's being done with satellites like the Black satellite, Blank Satellite and so on. So cosmology itself has changed a lot, and um, there hasn't really been, within philosophy of science, a philosophy of cosmology subfield that's been so well delineated until fairly recently. And it's been a sort of fortunate thing for me that I got involved with some people who were interested in this, and we had a grant a few years ago, and we've been thinking about and interacting with cosmologists, some of the central and important cosmologists, and have been thinking about philosophy of cosmology. And in fact, right now, I'm editing a book, which I hope will be play a role in with a, um, a fellow cosmologist named Anna Ias, um, which will be, we hope, set some of the ideas down in how uh, philosophers should think about philosophy of cosmology. And I very much enjoy interacting with other physicists and cosmologists. Um, so there are some issues that arise about the epistemology of cosmology, how we can know about the universe, how we can know about how the universe began, how we can know about how the universe will end, how we can know about whether the universe is infinitely large or so. In a sense, we have one data point which is unusual for science. <laughs> well, we have just one example yeah, of yeah. a universe that we can interact with. Maybe there are other universes, maybe not. Of course, there's lots of data from the That's cosmic right. microwave background. In fact, one of the most astonishing things is how much data comes from the cosmic microwave background. And another thought occurs to me when you were saying that you started in neurophysiology is that the universe turns out to be very, very simple compared to the brain. The brain is much, much more complicated. Yeah. The universe that we live in, we've discovered, is basically empty. Yeah. And it's basically homogenous. It's basically pretty much the same everywhere. And what's said to be isotropic from, at least within the universe that we can observe, looking in each direction, we pretty much see the same kind of thing. Uh, galaxies located here and there, and space itself is has any, take any cubic meter of space, and there are just, I don't know, you know 10 proteins, 10 proteins, 10 protons in, uh, in that cubic meter. Pretty much the same everywhere, pretty much the same temperature. So the universe is simple in certain respects, although the questions that cosmologists ask are very difficult. So uh, what, what are the, would you say, the, 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 the general big categories in the field? Uh, f from a philosophical point of view, not of cosmology as a science, mm -hmm. but uh, f uh, for the philosophy of cosmology. So for the philosophy of cosmology, first is the question of what is the nature of space and time? And of course, that's been of interest to philosophers from Leibniz and Newton and Descartes. You know, Leibniz and Newton just argued with each other or their, their sub uh, people argued with each other, and Kant thought a lot about it and so on. And there's been a lot of work about the nature of space and time, particularly after Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, so there's what is space and what is time. Then there are the contents of space and time. What is there in space and time? Well, there are, is matter in some sense, and there's the question, what is matter? Well, there's matter consists of certain kinds of particles, protons, ne neutrons, neutrinos, electrons. What are these? Well, the usual view in, within physics is that these are certain um, kinds of excitations of fields, so that the basic thing that exists are fields. Well, not quite basic, because this is all described by quantum mechanics. And the basic object in quantum mechanics is what's called the quantum mechanical wave function, or state. And there we might have come to bedrock, that that's the stuff that everything is made out of, and have made out of this quantum mechanical wave function. To make sense of that idea would take a bit of discussion, and maybe we don't want to go quite that far now. Um, 
then there's the question of what else there might be. And one view is that in addition to there being space and time and there being the stuff that occupies mm -hmm. space and time, there are also laws, laws which in some way govern or evolve or develop or describe the um, patterns and regularities in the universe. I myself am especially interested in a philosophy of science question of what is, or a question of metaphysics, what is the nature of a law of physics? Th that's a different question from what are the laws of physics. That's a question for physicists. The question for philosophers is what are laws of physics? Mm. And there are some views about that. And how does uh, this apply to then to uh, the understanding of, of the progress that cosmologists are making today? Well, uh, cosmologists, of course, are very interested in laws. There is a underlying equations that uh, describe the evolution of the universe and the expansion of space, and a certain equations that are pretty much the same equation with some different constants in it that describe the inflationary epoch, if there was such an epoch in the universe. This is equations that were found in Einstein's general relativity by an interesting Russian meteorologist, actually, uh, named Friedman. Alexander Friedman, um, these are laws that describe the evolution of the universe, the expansion of the universe. Of course, there are other laws that describe the evolution of stars, how stars um, evolve, produce energy, how they e expand after time, how they might explode, how they might die, and so on. There are laws that involve the formation of galaxies, and cosmologists are very interested in that. So physicists really spend their time trying to understand what the laws are, both the most fundamental laws and the derivative laws that they actually apply to describe how things actually happen in the universe. And philosophers are then interested in the question of what are laws, period. I'm not completely sure that an answer to the philosophy question will be of much help to the physicist question. There are a few places where I can see that the two issues intersect each other a bit. But I think that philosophers can deal with their question and physicists can deal with their question basically not in isolation of each other because philosophers have to look at what physicists are doing to understand what fit laws of physics are. Well, there are in order to say something about what laws of physics are. But I'm not sure that physicists have to know what's, um, what philosophers say about what laws of physics are. And in fact, I found in my own conversations with physicists that they're incredibly confused and all over the place when they try to deal with the philosophical question. Some physicists say we don't need philosophy or the only philosophers we need are those who can keep the, all the rest of the philosophers off our backs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's something to that. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes philosophers need somebody to keep other philosophers <laughs> off their backs, too. Um, I think that that's right by and large, actually, <laughs> but not about everything. So sometimes physicists can get incredibly confused conceptually about certain problems. Now, it might seem incredibly arrogant for a philosopher. I'm a philosopher of physics who knows some physics, but I'm not an, an expert in the way a physicist or a cosmologist would be about some of the issues that arise of any rating of cosmology. Um, but I am an expert in how to understand the structure of concepts and their relationship to each other. And philosophers get used to asking certain kind of questions and thinking clearly about certain issues. And I can think of some places where, in fact, I seem, I'm fairly confident that physicists have r run after, you know, chasing their own tails because they've been conceptually confused about certain issues. The big issue in the history of recent philosophy of physics has been the problem of understanding and interpreting what quantum mechanics is really about. That's a whole other subject. Here I think there's a great deal of confusion within the physics community propounded by physicists originally. 